My name is JP. For those who don't know me, I am the prep lab manager, the field trip organizer, and the collections manager here at the Tate Museum. Our other staff are Russell and in front between the two of us, Deline, who is our director. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, we do have a special introduction tonight because Melissa Connolly, uh, ex of the geology department here, was there when Joe started becoming a paleontologist. <laughs> so, Melissa, tell us what you know about Joe Peterson. She's last minute, so I, I'm not pretty She's, she's married it, but she was there. So, let's see, when was it, 96? About then, yeah. About 1996, Joe showed up, he was like 14. <laughs> and uh, to dig dinosaurs at Como Bluff, Wyoming. And a lot of times parents will bring their kids out, one, because they're either fascinated with dinosaurs and they won't shut up about it, or <laughs> they're hoping that, oh, we'll take you out in the field and, and then you will realize that you really don't like to do that and you'll find something like more realistic to do <laughs> in life. And so when uh, Joe showed up, I realized, yeah, I'm not talking him out of anything. <laughs> it was too late. Yeah, he's hooked. And uh, he came out several times, and it's just been an absolute um, pleasure to have out there. And so I knew he was going to make great, do great things. And so I'm so proud. Proud. I feel like I'm one of his parents, right? <laughs> and so uh, you know, I taught him everything he knows. You know, one of those things. And uh, I'm very proud of his accomplishments. Um, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Joseph Peterson, um, University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh. And he is here to give us a talk on um, Cleveland Lloyd, which is a very well-known uh, quarry, dinosaur quarry in Utah in the Morrison Formation. So many of you... Oh, well, the reason why he's visiting is because he's looking at uh, some specimens here at the Tate Museum at Camp de Sore and uh, from Como Bluff, which is the area that I met him first, um, you know, so many, so many years ago. And so it's neat that there's like this big circle now. He's back uh, looking at uh, Como Bluff items here at the Tate Museum, and, and so it's a pleasure to have him. So anyway, welcome. To Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming out on a chilly, it's Monday, right? Monday night? I've been traveling, so I'm not sure what day it is. Um, so yeah, uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work that uh, my crew and I have been doing out in Utah at the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, which is just south of Price, Utah, um, if you've never heard of it before. The important thing about the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, it is one of the most densest concentrations of meat-eating dinosaurs from the Jurassic in the world. Uh, so what I'd like to do is walk you through a little bit of an intro of the formation, the quarry, a little bit of its history, and then why the work we've been doing out there is a little bit different than what's been done uh, in the past. So our setting is here in the Morrison Formation, uh, which is a, a rather large geologic formation that represents the Upper Jurassic. Uh, it's predominantly characterized by mudstones, siltstones, sandstones, and limestones, and from that we can interpret what kind of environments they represent. So uh, rivers, lakes, floodplains, and channels, but really this is the home of the big dinosaur rush in North America. Okay, so a lot of the famous dinosaurs, other than T-Rex, that we, and other than Triceratops, uh, that we know about from North America came from here. So your big long-necked sauropods, your, uh, you know, your bizarrely backed stegosaurs, the slightly admittedly boring Camptosaurus, but also Allosaurus for Gilus, and a number of other theropod dinosaurs from the Jurassic are known from this uh, large package of plastic sediment that we find here in the American West. Now the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry uh, has been known since the 1920s. 1927 is when some the first formal excavations began there. Prior to that, it was identified by ranchers and cowboys moving through the area. Uh, the quarry is located here, as I mentioned, just south of Price. And it was designated as a national natural landmark in 1965, and then in, 19, or in 2009, 2019, excuse me, uh, it was redesignated as part of Jurassic National Monument. So now the name just keeps getting longer because Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry wasn't long enough. Now it's the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry at Jurassic National Monument. Uh, so my permits get longer just from that. So, and it's, yeah, one of the largest multi-taxa bone beds uh, in the Morrison Formation. Not only that, the Morrison is known for these bone beds. You either find isolated bones 
or a bunch of stuff jumbled together. But the concentration at this site is pretty incredible. Now today, if you go to the quarry, you'll see that it's actually covered up by these two butler buildings, these two sheds. And this row of boulders out front actually shows where that quarry excavation began in the 1920s. So everything that's in the museums, predominantly uh, in Salt Lake City, but a lot of Allosaurus stuff uh, around the world, uh, has been collected from here, mostly came from during these excavations. But in the 1980s, the USGS did a survey uh, where they went 30 feet behind these buildings and did some test cores going down to the equivalent unit of the bone bed, and they hit bone. So we know it goes back at least 30 more feet into the hillside, which is great job security. Uh, we will not be running out of, of dinosaurs there. Now, the early history of the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry is not that different than the early history of a lot of dinosaur paleontology. And you know, there was a big interest, but the science wasn't as rigid as it is today. Uh, a lot of it was what we would call smash and grab. Get rid of the rock, get the bones, and there was also apparently quite a lot of collecting bias. You'd find an allosaur rib, and they'd say, yeah, we know what those look like, and they wouldn't bother collecting them. Uh, so, and, and while they weren't selling skeletons to different institutions, if you donated to their dig, they would give you a skeleton. <laughs> but that's apparently not selling. Uh, but here's Malcolm <laughs> Lloyd, who the quarry is uh, partially named after, excavating from the Princeton crew. Uh, the, the quarry work, though, I, I would not want to be doing this out there without the butler buildings over me. We are a little bit spoiled having those sheds, uh, but it is pretty nice. The rocks there um, are kind of surprising. When you start thinking about a big pit with a lot of dinosaur bones in it, the, most of the bones are encased in this meter of uh, calcareous mudstone. So it's pretty hard to work in. You get a lot of calcite and barite nodules in it. And the bone unit stays fairly consistent at about a meter thick. On top of it, we have this very, very dense macritic limestone that varies from 10 centimeters to a meter. And you can actually walk along the exposure and see it undulate. So if this was a sandstone, this would make a little bit more sense. If it was a different type of silt, it could make some more sense. But it being a limestone on top of mudstone and bones occasionally jut up into both makes it really, really difficult to do work here. We'll spend a week just busting up limestone off the top to get down to the bone, bone bed, and there's really nothing more depressing than rolling a big chunk of broken limestone over and finding half an allosaur finger sticking out of it. And there's not a lot we can do at that point because that rock is so incredibly hard, um, and the bone inside of it is actually a lot softer. We don't just have dinosaurs there, though they don't, these other things don't get a lot of attention. We have carefully. <laughs> uh, which are uh, a type of algal spore. We find these little gyrogonodes, and they're very, very tiny. Just, you know, for example, the scale bar there is 500 microns. So these are about the size of a grain of sand. Um, but we find these not just in the limestone unit, but also in the mudstone below. And traditionally, these haven't really been looked at, because again, it's the rock. You get rid of the rock. But these are really important for telling us something about what kind of ecosystem we're looking at. And what we'll get into in a few minutes is how carophytes might be helping us figure out how that ecosystem may have changed. There have been an incredible amount of dinosaurs, though, that have come from Cleveland Lloyd. Estimates now go anywhere from 10 to 15,000 bones have come from this site. So this is uh, the old collection at the Natural History Museum of Utah. And it's, it's pretty cool how it's categorized. These are just left post-orbital bones from Allosaurus. These are just right post-orbital bones. So it's a beautiful catalog of, of this really well-known uh, Jurassic theropod. The, the collection has been redone since then, but it's still categorized in the same way. And most of the dinosaurs there, most of the Allosaurs are not fully grown. And you can see just from the sizes of some of the specimens here, there's quite a, a range of, of sizes and ontogenetic stages. This is a map of the quarry collections from 1990 to 1960. Now, for some reason, again, I mentioned how the, the science wasn't as rigid as it would be today. From one of these dots to another, that is three feet, not a meter, it's a yard, <laughs> which is really frustrating when we're trying to map things and correlate it to this, uh, because we use metric now. 
But this really just gives you an idea of the concentration. Uh, but I wouldn't rely on this map for anything in too much detail because these are, again, let's, uh, 30 years of excavating, and this is from various different crews. So for example, this really detailed block here, that was done by Yale, and they did a great job, but they forgot to put north on their map, so we think it goes there. <laughs> There's some other sections where they did a great job of finally numbering the bones, but they didn't put the numbers on the map. Joe, what about the white line above that yellow thing? Is that gap? Yeah. That's a really good question. We still don't know. <laughs> That's why there's been some material missing. And so uh, we use this more just as an example of the concentration. I wouldn't rely on it for, for strong research, but it gives you an idea of roughly where things are. But it's hard to read something like this because it's such a jumble. So what do we have there? Well, we have Camarasaurus. We have a couple of those. Possibly a Barosaurus, whatever that is, it might be a Diplodocus. A couple of stegosaurs, these camptosaurs, which I'm looking at now. And as of a few years ago, we know that we have a patasaurus there. Based on one midsection neck vertebrae, cervical vertebrae, it didn't walk there on its own. So we're hoping we find more of that soon. Uh, it was found right in the back of the quarry where hopefully we can continue excavating. So we've got quite a lot of very large dinosaurs, uh, saurischian and ornithischian, but we also have a lot of theropods. We have ceratosaurs and Torbosaurus, smaller theropods like Marshosaurus and Stokesosaurus, but Allosaurus is really the star of the show. We have more Allosaurus there than anything else. It's the only site I've been to where when a student finds a bone, and of course field identifications are always kind of sketchy, but we can pretty confidently say probably Allosaurus <laughs> because we just have so many. For example, if we look at the, con the concentration, 66% of the bones we have are Allosaurus. Um, we have Gliptops and Doniopolis, so bits of croc and bits of turtle, but I want to point out the turtle that we have there represents enough shell to fit in your palm, and three shed crocodile teeth. No fish, no amphibians, no other reptiles, virtually no aquatic vertebrate fauna. It's all just dinosaurs, mostly allosaurs. We don't even have a lot of the other theropods, um, stegosaurs and camptosaurs and camarasaurs make up a fair amount of the, you know, about 7% each of the rest of the concentration, but 66% allosaur. So if we go back and look at that map again, but this time color code it the same way, we have a lot of allosaurus. And when we look at a map like this, again, just kind of rudimentary, we do notice we don't get articulation. None of these skeletons are complete. We get blobs. We get a blob of stegosaur, a blob of camarasaur, a little bit of barosaur, and then just allosaurus mixed around everything else. So allosaurus is our bone matrix here. We have more of those than anything else. <clears throat> so this is a very, very strange site. And there's been a lot of different uh, attempts at interpreting what happened here. Uh, Jim Madsen was one of the researchers that first worked at the site. Uh, was quoted once as saying, there are about equal numbers of visitors to Cleveland Lloyd as there are hypotheses explaining how it formed. <laughs> so we figured about 12 years ago, let's take a crack at Cleveland Lloyd. But when we look at some of the distribution of ages, remember I said that there's a, a, quite a variance. 82% of the allosaurs there are juvenile with subadult. We don't have a lot of giant big allosaurs there. Most of them are not fully grown. And when we look at the orientations of long bones, for example, we map out where a femur or a tibia or even a rib, these bones with long elements, how are they oriented? It's all over the place. So there doesn't seem to be any strong fluvial sorting. There's nothing that's going to be orienting all the bones that might indicate a current on how things might have washed in um, or, or some kind of current that's mixing things up. It's really perplexing. If there was a strong current, that might help us out, but there's not. The way the bones are preserved, though, is usually in one of two ways. Usually, they're in really, really good shape. They come out of that mudstone in beautiful condition. Very few bones are crushed. There's a couple, but we don't see a lot of them. Now, some of them have quite a lot of barite and calcite nodules on them, and when it comes to prepping these, I usually leave them on. It's now part of its history because removing it, uh, these things have really kind of impregnated into the bone texture itself. 
we do find occasional bits of float, little broken thumbnail-sized pieces of weathered bone. But there's overall, when we look at the complete bones that we find, there's very little weathering. We don't see a lot of abrasion or evidence that a single bone transported far. There's not a lot of fracturing. And for 66% of our fauna being Allosaurus, there's a shockingly small amount of feeding traces. There's maybe 10 to 12 bones total that look like they've been chewed on. So statistically, not much at all. So, what caused the Cleveland Lloyd assemblage? Madsen's quote about slightly fewer number of visitors uh, to the quarry. Uh, so, two popular hypotheses among others, but the two that have kind of received the most attention. First is the predator trap that the Allosaurs went into this muddy environment going after uh, Camarasaurs or Stegosaurs that were stuck in the mud, and then they got stuck in the mud. And apparently they're not too smart because more of them came in and got stuck in the mud. <laughs> or it's a drought-induced assemblage. These are animals that were congregating to a dry and watering hole and died and got incorporated into it. So let's look at what we would predict from these types of assemblages, because we do know of drought-induced assemblages and predator traps, both in modern and fossil uh, assemblages. So what do these types of environments look like? So the predator trap, we'll start with that because I mean, it's, that's, the, that's the description on the Wikipedia page, so clearly that's the most common interpretation. Well, what do we see with predator traps? Well, usually you see skeletons preserved upright, because when something gets stuck in the mud, they get stuck like this. And so you should at least find the limbs articulated upright. Uh, most of the skeletons are going to all be connected, except for the parts that might have been sticking up out of the miring. You do see multiple taxa, a lot of different kinds of animals, uh, with variable sizes, because different things get stuck. You usually see a lot of feeding traces, because they're not going to get into the middle of an environment and get stuck. Or they're not going to get stuck at the margins, they're going to get stuck in the middle when they're standing there feeding, slowly sinking in. And we also, in a, in, a, in a situation like this, we would not see a lot of hydraulic influence. We wouldn't see a lot of sorting. So we have a couple of things that match what we're seeing at Cleveland Lloyd. A lot of different uh, types of animals. Very little evidence of post-mortem breakage. But the others, we don't see anything like that. We don't see articulation. We don't see feeding traces. We don't see uh, things standing up. And this is what animals look like. Sorry, this is gross. I should have warned you. Um, this is what animals look like when they get stuck in mud or sand. Uh, for example, cattle get stuck. So you, the limbs would be buried. Everything else is going to get worn away. And unless you get the entire thing buried, that's just a single horn sticking out of the mud. Okay. In this case, that whole cow is going to be in really good shape. Well, its skeleton will be. The rest of it, no. But that's what we would expect to see, and that's not what we see at Cleveland. So what about our drought-induced assemblages, animals that died from a drought and then their skeletal remains got incorporated into the environment? You'd see evidence of drying. You'd see, uh, this would be mostly in, the, in the, the surrounding sediments, you'd see evidence of mud cracks or some mineralogical uh, or diagenetic formations that indicate drying conditions. You would see some bones trampled or fractured because today in East Africa, when animals go near a drying pond and something dies, they'll step on the previous skeleton. But you'll see a lot of disarticulated, so busted up skeletons, or blobs where you have associations. So there's a pelvis of something here, but it's all broken apart. So again, we do have some evidence for this. And this is what modern drought-induced assemblages look like. Lots and lots of bones scattered around and animals that unfortunately perish as the water table is dropped and they can't survive long enough for that water table to, uh, to rise up again. So, from 2012 to 2022, we're going back again this summer, I've been bringing students out from University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and my colleague Dr. Jonathan Warnock from Indiana University of Pennsylvania has been bringing students out and we We've been excavating the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry, but also doing some work in the surrounding area, mostly looking at things like microfossils, which again, hasn't really been looked at much at Cleveland Lloyd because they don't have big claws and teeth. 
we've been looking at the geochemistry there, which also hasn't been done, and we've been applying some relatively new methods to dinosaur paleontology, such as photogrammetry at the entire quarry. So I'm going to kind of go through these and show you some of the things that we've been doing. So for the microfossils, not only have we been looking at caryophytes, but we decided to take some of the bulk matrix we collect from around the bones and bring it back to the lab and screen wash it and see what we find. Do we find mammals? Do we find fish? Uh, no, we don't. But what we do find, and I mentioned we find float, like these little thumbnail-sized bits of bone. We also find some that are even smaller. There's tiny little pebble-sized to coarse sand-sized bits of bone in this matrix. So we collected 60 kilograms and screen washed all of it. I had a student do this for a project. He collected 1,155 little bits of bone. And he gave each one a number and glued it to a toothpick. It was, I was pretty impressed. I don't think he enjoyed it, but it was pretty cool. <laughs> we also characterized each one of these fragments, which we coined intramatrix bone fragments, because they're just scattered throughout the lithified mudstone. Uh, based on their degree of abrasion. Remember, the whole bones look good, but some of our fragments are very angular. We call that a stage zero. Some are incredibly rounded. We call that a stage three. And we, we applied a sedimentological approach to this, saying, what's the matrix of the site? Well, it's a very fine calcareous silt. And some of these fragments are much larger. Now, if you have water that's moving silt into an environment, but nothing larger, then it's probably not going to be bringing in large clasts of fossils either. We call this hydraulic equivalence. So when we look at the grain size that would be equivalent to wash in fragments like this, we would have to be looking at sand, and we're not seeing sand. It's mudstone. So this means that the environment that was accumulating fossils here was so slow in its velocity, we weren't washing in these pebbles. They weren't tumbling in. They had to be there when that bone fell and broke apart. So how do you break a bone apart to tiny sand and pebble-sized particles? It gets exposed. It lays at the surface and falls apart. So we have bone hash and perfect bones. How do we explain that? How do we actually get that kind of assemblage in the same? And when we look at the distribution of how rounded and angular they are, it's all over the place. Some are really angular, some are really rounded. So if we think back to our basic rock cycle and sedimentological lessons from our geology classes, an angular grain means that something broke recently and didn't transport far. A rounded grain means it laid at the surface and moved around for a little bit. We have both and everything in between. Not only that, but some of these fragments inside the rock, they, are, they have a lot of pyrite embedded in as well. And so this gets us into some uh, chemistry, but our interpretation from this, just based on the bone fragments alone, is that our intramatrix bone fragments are what we would call lag. They didn't get washed in their local. These are from bones that were there, and at the surface, before they were buried, broke apart. But this, to get multiple types of ab abrasion and erosion, it didn't happen all at once. You have some that are recent, and some that are old. So they didn't all accumulate at the same time. And this really got us thinking more about how this assemblage could come together of even the full dinosaur bones. Is it, you know, we view Cleveland Lloyd as a place where things got stuck in the mud. Well, is that all at once or is that over a long period of time? So these bone bits are what we would call syndepositional to the larger bones. They had to accumulate and get buried at the same time. We look back at our little algal spores, our caryophytes. What we did is we took sediment samples from the upper half of the bone bed and the lower half of the bone bed, broke the sediment down, and collected every caryophyte we find. We have the same three taxa and a couple we couldn't really identify, but most of what we have is the same three taxa up and below. But what we noticed is that the lower half of the Cleveland Lloyd assemblage, our little spores, are not nearly as common. And they're really, really beat up. They look really hard. These lower ones were harder to identify. They were more abraded and broken apart. Our upper half of the quarry are twice as common, and they're beautiful. 
and they become even more abundant and common right when you get to that limestone contact above, which could be when this was turning into more of a lake or, or a more permanent body of water. So this, the abundance and the preservation suggests a dynamic depositional environment, not just one big assemblage and bones were accumulating over time. Something was changing with the environment while things were getting accumulated. And then we started looking at the geochemistry. Uh, we took a whole bunch of sediment samples from above the quarry, below the quarry, and in a few other sites we had found in the monument where we do find dinosaur bones. Uh, with these sediment samples, we did X-ray diffraction and X-ray fluorescence to look at the mineralogy and the chemistry that we have uh, at these sites. So over 40 samples taken total, seven of which were from Cleveland Lloyd. So what you're looking at here is our quarry samples in red, and everything else being background, and I picked a couple of the more shocking elements that we find, like arsenic, lead, chromium, and strontium. Now, one other hypothesis for the quarry that it was that it was a, a toxic, poisonous environment. Well, I can see how some might think that way. That's a lot of arsenic. But keep in mind, arsenic can be mobile through groundwater. And so for the last hundred and so million years, bones, a lot of phosphorus, acts as almost a, a, a chemical magnet to heavier metals like arsenic that might be moving through the environment. But we also found really uh, high levels of sulfur, copper. Remember we said we had a lot of pyrite. So whatever's happening at this site, we've got some what we call diagenetic influences, things that are accumulating after burial. But what would happen if you had a whole bunch of animals rotting in one environment? That's going to have an influence on the chemistry, and you're going to start seeing increases in things like lead and strontium and arsenic and chromium. <coughs> So we've got a very unique chemical signature. We've got some weird stuff going on with tiny little fossil bits that nobody's paid attention to. What about the actual quarry itself, like the bones that we find there? So we started applying some photogrammetric methods. We mapped the quarry, everything that was already exposed and everything that we uncovered. This is a more traditional type of mapping where you set up the grids and you have a plumb bob on a string and somebody stands back and draws it all out. Very detailed type of map, but really that's only giving you two dimensions. So what we wanted to do was apply a photogrammetric technique. So photogrammetry, if you're not familiar with it, is a process where you take lots and lots of photographs of an object, but you make sure that each of your photographs overlaps by about 30%. And then there are some cool software packages where you can dump all your photos in there, and it arranges your photos as cameras and starts to put together a three-dimensional model. Now, this has been used somewhat frequently with track sites. So uh, this is the Glen Rose track site in uh, Paluxy River in Texas. Unfortunately, some of these tracks are no longer there. They've been eroded out, but there's photos of them. So we can reconstruct tracks that are no longer present because we have the photos and we can align them and produce a 3D model. So our thinking is, what if we did this with an active dinosaur core? What if we make a 3D model every year that we excavate? And also, not only do you need a good camera for that, but there's also an app for that now, too. So that's great. <laughs> so during to test this out, and we've done this at some of our other spots in the quarry as well, we used the northernmost building at Cleveland Lloyd, which we don't do a lot of excavating in because there's a lot of bones on display in place for the public to come see. So we know there's a lot of bones exposed. Great place to test this out. Uh, we took over 1,000, about 1,100 photos or a little bit more on over 100 exposed bones. So here's our our hand-drawn map of the quarry, and then we digitized that and kind of traced around some of the elements. These are viewers platforms that when visitors come into the building where they can stand and, and watch us work. Okay. So we did the standard grid mapping, and then we took a whole bunch of photos, and from that we made this really cool three-dimensional model. And we've since been able to do this in the other building, the south building, but what we're doing is we excavate down 10 centimeters, do a round of photogrammetry, excavate down another 10 centimeters, and another round of photogrammetry, so we can pull up a 3D map of the quarry when we excavated it in 2017, and look at it in 2018. And if you animate them all together, it looks like the rock.
rock just disappears around the bones. It's pretty cool. So what can we do with something like this? By orienting this in an x, y, and z coordinate axis, we can start getting more than just a two-dimensional view of the quarry. We can get depth. So remember we talked about that row, compass rose diagram, the orientations are all over the place. That's looking at things flat in two dimensions. What if we start looking at things in three? So we put a false color layover on the map itself where the lowest quarter of the, of the quarry, the lowest quarter of that meter is going to be in blue, the yellow green is as we move up to the next quarter, and then the upper half is going to be orange to red, respectively. Now let's identify individual long bones. Remember that? Random compass rows? Well, these are the bones that we picked out that have a long axis. Things like vertebrae aren't that useful for this because they, they're round with pointy parts that go in all directions. But a rib, a limb, those are great. And again, this is just looking at it in 2D. But if we start actually outlining where those bones are in the map, we start seeing clusters of bones in the lower part moving up the quarry. So just to keep things kind of color-coded, in the lowest portion, the lowest 30 centimeters, things are moving roughly north-south. Pretty strong orientation. When we move up to around that mid-30 centimeters, moving a little bit north-northwest, and then in the uppermost portion, we're back to north-south again. If you, if you compress all that down to just one map, yeah, the orientations are all over the place, but when you start looking at it in slices, we have some really strong orientation, <laughs> indicating that there was some kind of fluvial activity, enough to bring in a bloated carcass. So what are some of the primary conclusions that we have from all of the stuff that we have? We're thinking that the Cleveland Lloyd dinosaur quarry represents an ephemeral pond, a seasonal deposit. It's not one big dump of a whole bunch of dinosaurs. We have things that are getting washed in at different times. During the wet season, when the water table is up, carcasses wash in. During the dry season, things might die at the, at the, around the banks. Some bones are going to be exposed and broken down. When the wet season comes up, things are going to be nicely and buried again. And this is supported by that variability we see in carophytes. In the lower half, they're real beat up. That would indicate subaerial exposure. They're being exposed to dry conditions. And then when the water table goes back up, we get nice ones growing. But notice we don't have any other aquatic fauna. There's no fish living in there because it dries out every year or every so many years. And also that abrasion profile of our little bone fragments also fits with this hypothesis. During the wet season, bones that are broken recently get buried. During the dry season, bones are laying at the surface, breaking down even further into smaller rounded bits. So it's probably not one event, but maybe three, possibly more. Again, this is supported by, again, that variability in the carophytes, our little bone fragments, and the 3D mapping is showing that we have multiple depositional events here, not just one big washing. The geochemistry might explain the lack of scavenging. We're not 100% sure on that. The heavy metals could be diagenetic. They could be something that happened after burial occurred. They could be bioaccumulated, meaning as the water table is dropping and you have a bunch of carcasses rotting, it's going to get really gross. <laughs> and it, you're probably going to get heavy metal concentrations from that. The sulfides that we're finding do indicate high levels of decomposing organic material. So this wouldn't have been a place you would want to go for a midday snack <laughs> anyway. Um, and we do see this in environments today in Africa. As a pond is drying out, and there's carcasses in it, it gets really gross, there's a lot of algae. No, things aren't going to go scavenge in there because it, it could potentially be harmful to them. It smells too bad. And really this challenges the predator trap hypothesis. If we really look at this collectively, what makes a predator trap? Well, a whole bunch of predators stuck in the mud. Well, not exactly. La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles, that's a predator trap. You can see articulation, you can see where 
the bubbling of asphalt ground bones together and smooth them. We don't see anything like that at Cleveland Lawyer. So just because we have a bunch of predators there doesn't necessarily make it a predator trap. What we think actually happened here is that carcasses were periodically transported in, continued decomposing, and then the water table would fluctuate. <coughs> so I, due to these concentrations and these really highly eutrophic conditions during that low water table, we're seeing that variability. So it's as, not as exciting as, you know, allosaurs getting stuck in the mud. I think the only thing that died here was caraphytes. <laughs> but that's really what things are starting to point to there. We just don't see all the other evidence that you would expect for a predator trap. So to kind of put this into some cartoons, you have a high water table with your rotting allosaurs, among other things. The water table drops and you have carcasses exposed. If that water table stays low and it's dry long enough, some of those bones will break apart. And then the water table rises and you include new carcasses washing in. Or, because I grew up watching a lot of Monty Python, we have to animate it. And you can see it just happened over and over and over again. Or as one of my co-authors called it, the drunken allosaur pool party. <laughs> So what's next, though? Well, we're not done. We're still testing these hypotheses further. We have new areas in the quarry to excavate and continue working to really test these ideas and see if we find the same trends with new spots in the quarry that we could excavate. Uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're getting ready to take down those two sheds and put one big building over it and move the footprint so we can continue working back. We're not going to run out of bones anytime soon. And the great thing about this site is even though in the past... You know, historically, it wasn't treated with a lot of respect. It was, you know, smash rocks, get bones out. Um, it's one of the sites where it's so concentrated, you can kind of shake the edge of sketch and say, all right, do over here and start new excavations. So along with that, we're going to be continuing that excavation at decimeter scale excavation. Take the entire excavation surface down to 10 centimeters, only remove bones when we have to, when they're at risk. Because nobody wants to drive out there and look at a hole in the ground with nothing in it, but we also want to keep these bones protected. So when they're ready to remove, we remove them and we'll replace them with a cast or a 3D print so viewers that come to the site can see how the process works. Continue doing more bone fragment analysis. Um, we've actually started bringing back large jackets of just matrix, which don't sound exciting, but as you slowly work through them, we're starting to find these little bone fragments in situ, still in the rock, and now we're starting to look to see if there's clusters. Now, was this once a small bone that just pulverized? And we're continuing to do photogrammetry every single year at the site. That's like the last thing we do for the last two days is just take lots and lots and lots of photos. We're also starting to do some stable isotope geochemistry, which is one of the other things that I came here to get, is look at some allosaur teeth from various other Morrison sites, one of which is Nail Quarry at Coma Bluff, where I first worked, uh, with, with Melissa and Russell and a number of other people, uh, where we know that there's chewing going on. We have large and small allosaurs, but what type of isotopes are we seeing in the teeth? Are they really eating the same thing, or are maybe juveniles eating something else? That might tell us something about behavior in a population of allosaurs throughout the late Jurassic. So we want to do these types of isotopic analyses, not just at Nail, but at Cleveland Lloyd, the Mygat Moore Quarry in Colorado, and a number of other bone beds uh, in the Jurassic. And one of my other favorite subfields to play in is actualistic taphonomy. So taphonomy is the study of how fossils are made. Actualistic taphonomy is trying it yourself. <laughs> so what happens when you take a chicken carcass and put it in an extremely high pH setting. Let's find out. And so we actually have a site, a super fun site outside of Chicago, where there's a little pond that has a pH of 13. And we've been putting dead chickens in it to see what happens. <laughs> Essentially what we're looking at is how do tissues preserve, break down, what does this do to the bone chemistry, and how does this compare to sites like Cleveland? So, a lot of people have helped out with this over the last 10, 11 years. Uh, the staff of the Natural History Museum of Utah have been great. The BLM have been integral in letting us work at that site. 
Uh, my co-authors, John Warnock, Chris Noto, Jason Coonan, and Steve Clawson were uh, great to work with on this, and of course, UW Oshkosh fit the bill for a lot of this along with the BLM. But I also really want to thank specifically Melissa and Dad. Thank you for driving me out here in 1996 for my first dig. And Melissa, thank you for all of the training that you've helped me through over the years. Um, it is really cool being back here and, and sharing this with everybody. You'll make me cry. So. <laughs> but I want to thank everybody for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. you feel through, but I guess that's it. This was last summer. <laughs> Most of these were UW Oshkosh students. Uh, we had 13 that came out. And that's that's not, this, this isn't everybody. <laughs> but usually we try to keep it to around Who's 8 to 10. The guy right the tape shirt. What a nice shirt. shirt. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of people asking where they can get that shirt. So yes. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Um, so nail quarry, another multi-taxic Morrison bone bed, a lot of allosaur chewing going on there, because we, we know they're doing that there, we find a lot of chewed bones. I think the important thing to remember is that even if you have something as big as, you know, a, a brontosaurus, that can move, that can float, you know, it's, it's like a big balloon when it starts getting right. Uh, and <laughs> things move, in, in Wisconsin, a cow dies, falls in the Mississippi, you find it in New Orleans. Yeah. These you know, animals are mobile, they are sedimentary particles, and their bones are too. So it's very, very likely that a lot of the bone beds we're looking at in the Morrison are these post-mortem assemblages, yeah. these, these time-averaged accumulations. Um, I think Mike got more is another good example of that. Uh, but nail, certainly, some of the, the lithology there is not that different than Cleveland Lloyd. Right. It's very similar. It's not... Um you know, not a lot of aquatic animals mm -hmm. and things, where occasional snail, you know, exactly. like just very occasional. We can find the occasional snail in the limestone there. Yeah, near the line, near the top, exactly. And, um, but we also have a ash bed, or part of one, right at the base of nail. Do you have ash beds near yours as well? Above. It's above, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if that would have any kind of influence or impact and um, the we you said it's a silt silt mm -hmm. So silt, is it? It's pretty blocky. It's not mm -hmm. laminated. Oh no, it's horrible. It's, horrible. <laughs> yeah. it's very very blocky. Okay, interesting. So I'm just trying to compare and, and draw that picture in my brain. It's very very similar, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons I want to get back to nails as yeah. well. Cool. Check that out. We're working on it. We didn't we didn't even talk about. On your list of uh, theropods, I didn't see Epentarius or Saurophaganax. Right. Are all your allosaurs small, or do you just regard them all as the same? Species? They're all pretty small. I mean, we occasionally find a large one. We found a beautiful manis claw about this big two years ago. Perfect. But it's more in line with Fragilis, like a big Fragilis, um, not super big. And it's funny because then, like 10 centimeters above, we found a claw that was the same size, but absolute crap. <laughs> and like worn out before it was buried, worn over. So again, there's that dynamic there. But uh, more to your point, no, we don't see any big, big, big theropods there. And even the Torvosaurus, it's a lacrimal. It's one bone. <laughs> again, probably didn't walk there on its own, but we're curious to find more. And there's, a, there's quite a large, I'd say out of all the theropods, there, the one that surprises me for being large is Ceratosaurus. Mm -hmm. So the one that's on display at the NHMU in Salt Lake is from Cleveland Lloyd, and it's it's a whopper. It's very large. <coughs> so, have you guys found the bottom of the quarry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 
it, it's it's a little bit a little bit siltier, not as calcareous. It's a lot softer, and we just we don't see just it. The bone. Change in the bone. Yeah, yeah. We hit the bottom, and yeah, the bone bed stays fairly consistent to being about a meter thick. Mm -hmm. So why all the out? Isn't that a great question? <laughs> I don't know. So I will say. <laughs> Why juvenile? So I have a hypothesis on juveniles in that is if you, we were talking about this earlier today, if you go to the Everglades today to just survey how many alligators you'll see, how big they are, you're going to see a lot of alligators. Most of them are about that big. You don't always see the 12 footers and you don't always see the tiny ones. The average population size is sub it up, right? I think we might be seeing that at Cleveland Boy. I think we're just looking at kind of the, because we have such a dense concentration, we're getting an image of kind of what type of population distribution we had. As far as why so many allosaurs, that's, some, that's why we want to get into the isotopes more, because that, is there something about their behavior? Now, this is the really weird one. In between the two quarry buildings in the 1980s, an egg was found. <laughs> that egg, is very likely Allosaurus. It's similar to an Allosauroid egg with an embryo that was found in Portugal. This egg, though, was CT scanned and has an abnormally thickened shell on one side, which is something birds do when they're waiting to lay eggs, but there's environmental stresses, like a drought, and they hold that egg in the oviduct too long, and it becomes, you know, it's unable to hatch, then it pretty much dies. So that's one egg. Maybe there was a nesting site or about Who knows, right? That's one egg, 15,000 bones. However, <laughs> and this is the part that gets me, when that egg was shown to Jim Madsen before he died in the 80s, his response was, oh, that's what those were? Oh, no. <laughs> because there's a lot of round concretions of barite there. Again, evidence of sub exposure and drying. So we've been looking through the spoil piles but so far we haven't found anything. He was also known to mess with people, so maybe he was, but I don't like that joke. Um, so you can guess where we're excavating really, really strong in between those two buildings. We want to see if we find more. If we find a whole bunch of eggs, that is a possibility that it was in a close proximity to a nesting site. That all being said, if you look at drought-induced assemblages today in places like East Africa, and you look at crocodiles, they will congregate, they, tie to, they, they sometimes try to tie that reproductive cycle along with climate, and they'll hold the egg in the oviduct long if they have to. Birds do this. So there is some seasonality along with uh, reproduction. So perhaps they were just in the area for one reason or another. When they die, they wash in. It's also possible that allosaurs were pretty common back then. It could be. You've got a lot of meat walking around. <laughs> What's that? So, how many else? Exactly. So these are all some things we want to play with, some ideas we're testing, but we, we don't have a good answer yet. That's that's the fun mystery we're still playing with. And then to, you're now working at the, the 10 centimeter layer by layer. So did anybody in those previous excavations actually start to fit bones together, or nobody has ever been able to say, this bone fits to that bone. Unless they're in very close proximity, no. I mean, they kind of go off of size, like this vertebrae is about the same size, must go together. You know, they're allosaurs, so they, they must go together. Pretty much most of the dinosaurs that are on display that came from Cleveland Lloyd are going to be composites. They're all from the same site, but they're going to be composites. And in most museums, not all, but most museums around the world, if it's an allosaur, guess where it came from? <laughs> Except Larry. Except Larry. So, well, except for the tail. Larry. There's a few, but <laughs> most of the allosaurs you see, you know, like for example, uh, in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, they have one allosaur skeleton. It's a Cleveland Lloyd one. Um, so, yeah, a lot of those are going to be composites. Where there have been some studies done recently uh, on other bone beds, looking at uh, histology as a way of matching age to see, okay, it's a jumble, but these ones are all exactly the same age, so they must go together. Still hypothetical, but that might be an approach that we can get to. Well, you have, you have them separated by size. Mm -hmm. So if the bones are separated by size, that 
usually that's a, age or but environment. exactly so they're all it's going to be pretty similar again we don't have a lot of tiny ones we don't have a lot of big ones so most of our sample is within a range so um we're still trying to work out some ways in which we can say who goes to what but with that kind of distribution and scattering it's, it's pretty tough but if you believe they were put in in different in the layers, different orientations and that is one thing we were we have been noticing you get clusters in these pods, and it's usually where the limestone is the thickest. We get a cluster, with like a, a tighter cluster within that decimator scale. So those would go together. We've got a big blob of Camarasaur that clearly goes together. But throughout the rest of the unit, we're not sure. I've seen one, and it was more, and it's it's pathological. It's a root. It's got a big, great callus on it, and so it's part of it's bending up. But we don't find anything like this. Not like the sauropod out at Como, which is literally standing standing up. No, we don't find anything like that.